Uh, good evening. Can anybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Just making sure I go out okay uh, from way down here in Pearl River County, Mississippi. So I'm a, I'm a stickler for getting started on time, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. People can jump in where they can. Now, tonight's lecture, uh, if any of you have looked at the uh, material, there's really no way to get all of it into one night without driving, without messing your brain up. It literally is a lot to take in. So we're going to go through probably about half of it tonight. And I, I looked where it could probably comfortably add the other half on to uh, the lecture in a couple nights from now. So uh, the first part of human anatomy and uh, physiology is, you know, it, you know, truthfully, it's not the most interesting stuff in the world. We talk about doing things at the, uh, of course, at the cellular level, the chemical level, and the things of that nature. And it's just really uh, hard to get in at one time. It really takes a lot of studying on your own, away from the class, away from the PowerPoints, get into the text material, maybe listen to the audio lectures, and even follow up on some outside sources if you need to. But uh, anatomy and physiology, uh, when it's at the cellular level, tissue level, it's really kind of, it was really kind of boring to me, but when it got into the part about putting the organs together, the organ systems and the way they function, it did get a little bit more interesting. Now, what we want to talk about is uh, first a couple of terms, anatomy. That's simply, uh, that is the study of the structure of an organism and uh, in the components that, that it makes up of it. So anatomy is the structure, physiology is, is the function that examines bodily functions of a living organism. Uh, anatomy is even broken up into a couple of uh, other fields like gross anatomy. That's things that's visible to the naked eye, like you will see like in a science lab perhaps or a cadaver lab. Things are, that you can see and put your hands on that's uh, unaided, of course. And it breaks down into microscopic anatomy, which is uh, similar to microbiology but it's things that can only be seen through a microscope. And with some very uh, high-tech microscopes, it, it's pretty fascinating at the way some of these cell structures break down and what parts you can see of them. So, uh, and then physiology examines all the bodily functions. That's uh, a whole chapter by itself, and that's why we'll kind of blend into it in a couple of days and make it uh, work together. But uh, to break it down, a cell, you know, it's the basic function, functional unit of the body. They're very small. Uh, there's literally millions of them, millions upon millions. And where this comes into play, it's like people may ask, well, why do I need to know this at the pre-hospital level or uh, street level? And we'll study about later on when you get into more advanced EMS information, how cell death, when a cell starts to die, that is, uh, it's a myriad of changes to where the, the, the cells will die, the organs will die, the systems will die, and then the whole organism will die. It's kind of like, almost like uh, in a reverse order. So, and each each side, each cell has very specialized components that are inside of them. For example, um, they look different, they vary in shape. The neurons, are cells of the nervous system. They kind of have a nucleus and the body, they have a lot of extensions off of them that'll almost look like lightning bolts in a way, if you will. Hence, uh, you know, electrical travel. You got some cells that are cardiac cells that are kind of irregularly shaped. They have their own function. They're specialized. And uh, cells of animals, humans, for the most part, have a round type shape compared to where like plant cells, for the most part, will be kind of rectangular or square. So, and maybe remember some of that from uh, basic biology and uh, high school, junior high, and things like that. So over time, cells mature, they differentiate, they uh, they die. Some cells don't live very much at all, uh, very long at all. Like red blood cells, ever about every 120 days, uh, 90 to 120 days, red blood cells have died and reproduced. So about every 120 days, you've got new blood. Other cells might not 
so often some uh, will take longer, some will take uh, sooner. Like hair cells or your scalp, uh, you know, dandruff, that's dead skin cells that are dying off and starting to shed off. Dry skin, flecking off. Those uh, those don't really live a long time. And even sometimes if they are healthy, they're one of the first ones that gets scraped off, scraped away, and uh, new cells take their place. The A group of cells that have a similar function, of course, are called tissues. You've got uh, like liver tissue, lung tissue. It's a group of cells that makes tissues. Now, with a bunch of a group of tissues together, form an organ. It takes a lot of different types of tissues to, to form the, the lungs, the kidneys. There are different tissues in there that form the same function, but those tissues together will form an organ. And when you get a bunch of uh, groups of tissues and organs together, they actually form, uh, they make up body systems. It takes, uh, as far as the cardiovascular system, for instance, you've got the, you got the heart, you got the vessels, blood, all of that make up uh, the cardiovascular system. All, and all cells, uh, they communicate electronically. You'll, we'll, when we get into pathophysiology a little bit more, cells have positive charges, negative charges. Some of them are able to transmit impulses. So they actually communicate electrochemically. That's one reason you can pick up a heartbeat with an electrocardiogram because it measures it and it displays it upon a, a machine where we can make sense of it. So, uh, Electrolyte imbalances. We'll talk about the sodium and potassium pump in a little while, but sodium positive charge, uh, potassium uh, is a charged ion as well. And if you're depleted in one or the other, it takes uh, an electrical charge and discharge for a muscle to contract, or it takes the right amount of potass potassium and sodium to keep a muscle from contracting too much. So let's say if you lose too much potassium, but you got more sodium, that's when you start going to have muscle cramps, muscle cramps and uh, fatigue. So all of those play a role together. So if you start losing electrolytes, you can have muscle cramps, you can start shivering, or even to the point to where you have uh, some cardiac dysrhythmias because the, it, it'll actually cause the heart not to uh, respond electrically as much at all. So if you... Uh, I'm not sure how much of, I was looking at some of the book, the text online textbook the other day and the audio works pretty good. Like if you're traveling around in a car and things like that, but you can't really uh, study this too much on your own because what I say, a lot of it's going to go in and out. And these slides, I'm being very quick with them. So there's no way I expect you to remember these things. So basically there's two general classes of cells and that's divided up into uh, sex cells and somatic cells. Sex cells define, of course, sexual function, sexual uh, being, and being able to reproduce. Somatic means anything to do with organs, systems. So all the rest of them are grouped into one thing. Cells, we used to see very basic cells uh, in lower grade sciences as like being three parts. You had a cell membrane, you had cytoplasm in the middle, and then you had a nucleus. But as you can see from this picture, it's a very complex little uh, little structure. The uh, microbiologists, people that really get into that, you know, they can spend seven or eight years studying parts of a cell and how they work. And sometimes they still tell you that they don't know uh, as much as definitely they'd like to know. Cells contain a membrane, nucleus, cytoplasm. Can you see a cell with a naked eye? You know, some cells are pretty big. You, if, you, uh, if you break open an egg, that is a single cell. The yolk is the nucleus. The uh, egg white is the cytoplasm, and the uh, of course you see the membrane that's around it. If you if you rupture it, it's going to run out. It's going to pour, but that is actually a cell that you're looking at. The uh, the nucleus part of the cell contains genetic material. It uh, controls the activities of the cells, the kind of the powerhouse, the control feature of the cell, and uh, they uh, that's where like DNA is stored, created. And it's where it breaks off and it's its genetic makeup of the cell that can tell it how to function actually. As you can see in the middle, the cytoplasm is kind of like a jelly-like type substance that's in there. It, it supports the structures. 
the uh, nucleus that also has a nuclear membrane. It has a uh, chromatin things in the middle that forms your chromosomes and your genes. These are actually going to get a little bit different, uh, a little bit more into it in a minute. But the cell uh, membrane. It's also called a plasma membrane because it is uh, kind of soft, gooey. They are very delicate. The cell membrane contains the molecules. It has pathways in it, so things can go in and out of the cell. These pathways also, they allow signals from outside the cell to be detected and uh, be transmitted inside. That could be done without uh, like a, a break in the cell or a cell membrane. Intracellular and extracellular activity, they refer to inside and outside of the cell. Anytime, if you remember uh, terminology, intra means within, extra means uh, out. So you'll talk, we'll talk about intracellular fluid after a while and extracellular fluid. Uh, there's tiny folds on the surface that helps increase surface area. Some cells aren't smooth, they're wrinkly. Uh, just kind of like the brain. It's wrinkled before it can get more surface area into a smaller uh, smaller area. Uh, most human cells have two layers. It's called a bilipid layer as far as the cell membrane, and it's made of fat, phospholipids. Anytime you hear the word lipid, that means a fat. Cholesterol makes up these cell membranes, so you, you really do need cholesterol. Some of the stuff that says, hey, cholesterol-free, don't eat cholesterol, uh, you've got to have some cholesterol in your body. Now, there, too much of the bad stuff, of course, gets bad. Too much of anything is bad. But uh, cholesterol makes up, uh, you know, the secretion of your eyes. The, uh, the, the It's kind of the glue that holds a lot of these cells together. The membrane is most, for the most part, a, sem, a semi-permeable, sorry, sem, semi-permeable, membrane, which it means allows, it allows some things in and some things it will not uh, allow to, to uh, go in or out. It, it's kind of a cell membrane is there to maintain uh, homeostasis for, for that part. So some things are able to, as we'll talk in osmosis and diffusing in a, and diffusion in a little while, uh, some things are easily able to go across the membrane that require no help. And there are some things that actually will require assistance and maybe an enzyme or something else that will uh, cause it to go through. The cytoplasm, just to retouch on that a little bit, it's fluid-like material, kind of gel-like substance. It contains uh, the contents of the cell, provides an insulation. It's a stabilizer for them to stay in. The uh, cytosol is the fluid part of the cytoplasm. There is a gel part, and of course, the cytosol is the fluid part. And for example, if you think about, uh, say, like some wet cement, uh, as long as you've got a, a, the amount of um, water in there with the amount of uh, cement, you're going to have an equal mixture. But if you take more of one than of the other out, you start pulling uh, the water out of dry concrete, what's going to happen to it? The same thing is going to happen to these cells, of course. The organelles are those little structures inside there. They're very small. That's what they're called, organelles. They, uh, <clears throat> they've got several of them in there. What they, they, what they accomplish the task that actually the cell is uh, set up to do. They're responsible for the growth, the maintenance, the metabolism. They, uh, you know, they're, they're very small, can't be seen by the naked eye for, for the most part, just about in any of the cells outside the eggs and stuff. Then you'd have to really know what you're looking for. But inside those parts, organelles, you're going to have uh, centrioles. They're responsible. They're a, they're a spindle-like structure. They're responsible for the movement of DNA strands, and cell division requires a pair of them. Uh, you have to have that in order to divide like a spindle. It divides in half, then they reform and to make a, to make another one, to make another cell just like them. The uh, ciella and flagella, usually on the outside of the cell, they're responsible for uh, cleaning, making a sweeping type movement, uh, keeping fluids going by, not letting them stay static on them. And uh, the flagella are used to propel the cells to which uh, they are attached. They're able to propel around. Some of them are able to move around. But uh, fluid is constantly going by and bathing cells. If, uh, if they're not able to do that, 
then it's going to cause a breakdown, say like skin cells or like if you got a place in the lungs uh, form an abscess. If structures get static around cells, it can't sweep them out. They have problems. That's when you start seeing abscesses and things like that develop. The uh, ribosomes, they're made of a protein called RNA. You've heard of the, the, the DNA. RNA is simply something that carries like messages. Uh, it, it'll take, it's called ribose nucleic acid. It will, it's what carries uh, the message to like the sodium potassium cells, like, hey, I need you to release the sodium release and, or release the pat, potassium, change places. It's a messenger type organelle that gets that done. Also, with the new uh, vaccination coming out as far as COVID, they said that it uses it attacks to it attaches to messenger RNA. There's a lot of uh, division and everything out there about that. A lot of it's not understood. But what it does is most immunizations use a protein from a an infective agent. So in the past, they used to actually give people live polio viruses. They had a chance of really catching it. And when flu shots come out, they used to use real flu uh, parts of the flu virus to really do that. They're dead flu viruses. They, they've got away from that now to where they use things that simulate the virus to kind of make a footprint to where the, the RNA detects that. Then they will release the antibodies or the immune response toward it. Messenger RNA. It's kind of like a wanted poster in the in the post office. You might see of a wanted person or online. So you don't have the actual person, but let's say you have a guard dog or a trail dog, and you don't have the actual person, but you got a picture of them or something that has their scent on them. So in effect, when you when your dog sees that person that you showed them on the uh, poster. They will know what to get after, whether to trail it or whether to attack it. That's kind of what the messenger are and how it works. It's a picture of what the threat is. And it kind of gets, it kind of makes a memory. It's like, hey, when you see this, you need to attack it. Well, they have to get in shape first. So if it's introduced to them, it's, a, it's kind of like a football workout. It gets you tired, worn out in order to get your immune system built up to build up that immune response in order to attack that uh, per, uh, threat when it does come in. Sometimes flu shots can cause you to feel that way. Even back when you had uh, childhood immunizations, they in uh, or your, your children may have had them. There's a few days there when they get fever, they get sick. It's it, so it's that's always been happening. There's there's a lot of buildup now saying about the all of the uh, short term responses immediately, but that's always happened. So anyway, I said all that just to tell you about how RNA works. And if you put messenger RNA on it, that's it's kind of just relaying a message to it of what to look for. The endoplasmic reticulum or NR, it's a network of paths through which substances and proteins move. It's kind of a duct system inside of the vein. I'm sorry, inside the vessel. There are uh, two types of ER. One is smooth, which is, and the reason it's smooth is it don't have ribosomes on it. Uh, which contain the RNA. And if it's rough, it means it contains ribosomes. There's also the Golgi apparatus, the Golgi complex, which is kind of a big factory inside of there. It, uh, it simply deals with proteins that are synthesized on the ribosomes. It's got main function. It's the three main functions of it is it, it concentrates and packages secretions such as hormones and enzymes. Now, hormones. Uh, you're going to see this for like uh, glands, uh, you know, sex organs, things like that are actually going to secrete hormones, pituitary gland, or some uh, hormones or, or the other cells may secrete enzymes. Any chemical you see with ASE on the end of it is an enzyme. What does in enzymes, what they do is they cause things to happen. Insulin I'm sorry, just back a minute. Uh, for example, if uh, the testicles will release hormones into 
the bloodstream. They come out, they go into the blood, they attack certain target tissues, they cause male, male characteristics. And uh, that that's, comes from the Golgi apparatus in those cells that actually the ones that secreted those. So in enzymes, cause things to happen like uh, in the digestive system. The enzymes break down like starches and turns them to sugar so they can be stored in the blood in, in the blood and made glucose as far as food for the body. And uh, they also work to modify, they're kind of like the repair house also of the of the cell as well. Lysosomes, they get rid of the waste. They're like duct work or the garbage men that get the uh, dead material or waste material out of the out of the cell. So you got microfilaments that are very that are broken down into like actin and myosin, which has to do with uh, contraction or muscle buildup. The it's kind of like structure or a network, a web web type uh, function that keeps the things together. And uh, I'm sorry, I said Golgi is the powerhouse, but it's a mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. That's where a lot of the big functions uh, take place. Usually double membrane, they play a central role in the production of energy. Your cells require all this for the en energy. It's usually smooth. There's no uh, ribosomes on the outside. It, it pretty much has like what a network, for lack of a better word, is a matrix on the inside as far as all of the structures that work. Uh, and when I say wiring, it's kind of like with a little messenger RNA in there that it controls. The uh, peroxisomes, they simply are there to speed up. It's kind of like adding octane to fuel. And the vesicles or vacuoles or sacs that are formed and part of a cell membrane that folds inwards. Sometimes they catch things, things may get stuck there, or it may actually use as a uh, something to bring material on the inside. Now the nucleus is the largest part of the cell. It, uh, it's the control center, it's the powerhouse. It contains all of the genetic, genetic instructions. It sends out messages and functions. And uh, it tells how things are gonna be. And this is stored as chromosomes. It is made up of, uh, the chromosomes are made up of uh, DNA and other various proteins. And inside the uh, nucleus is a another type of fluid called nucleoplasm. And it actually holds where it sustains where RNA is stored and also DNA where it is stored as well. The uh, life cycle of a cell, I said all, cells don't live a real long time. Probably the ones that live the longest are found in the bones. Uh, blood cells have a very short lifetime, but most human cells divide between, let's say average lifespan, they say, let's say 70 years, 75 years. That's just a, a number we're throwing out there. It says most human cells divide between 40 and 60 times before they die. Now that's before the cell dies, not uh, not not the human, of course. And a life cycle of the cell includes four steps. You got the interphase, which happens uh, when they inside the nucleus when it decides to do it. The cell divisions when it actually uh, starts to form a border and divide. Cytoplasm, it's a cytokinesis. That's when this when it starts to border itself off or gate itself off. And of course, the differentiation part. Uh, <clears throat> differentiation is a process of specialization of a cell. It makes it, that's what makes it unique, like cardiac cells, uh, gastric cells, neuro, neurons, uh, osteocytes of the bone. These are what differentiate and makes the function of it, makes its function unique. There's another type called that don't specialize or they divide repeatedly without specializing. And that's something like stem cells. They divide either to pretty much similar cells called daughter cells or divide so that one daughter cell becomes partially specialized. 
but that is a uh, that's deep into the study of uh, genetics. Now, the cell division, when it's at a normal and controlled rate, in other words, what's supposed to happen with it, the there's really nothing wrong with that. That's what's supposed to happen. However, sometimes cells can divide and grow and spread at uh, at a rate higher than what the cell was meant to. And when they do that, they become enlarged. When something becomes uh, enlarged, it forms like a mass or something that's different than what's around it. It's abnormal cell growth. It's called a neoplasm. And it's uh, it starts to divide fast. It gets the growth is quicker than the cells that are around it. It's it's noticeable. It might not be noticeable immediately to the to the naked eye. However, as far as the cell structure itself, it starts to become noticeable. Now, after a point when the cell gets big enough and it's really a big mass in there, you're going to see what they call it. It can become a tumor. Now, a tumor is a uh, a growth of all those cells that starts to form a mass, and they can be benign or malignant. Now, when they're benign, that means it remains within the epithelium. It may be swelling up, but it hasn't went past those original cell membranes yet. It's really not spread anywhere. It's not really wanting to spread. It's in a localized area, and uh, they can pretty much, as long as it's localized, they, that's when they can be surgically removed and dealt with pretty dealt with pretty easily as long as they're benign and stay in a uh, small place. Usually don't become life-threatening. There is, there has been some where there's rare, there's exceptions to every rule in medicine. So there's never an always, but there has been times that when these tumors have formed, they weren't really a malignancy, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they've actually formed in like the deep areas of the brain, things like that, and start pressing on some, uh, life dependent structures and it might not be a cancerous brain tumor however it being as big as it is pressing on other structures there has been times that when that has have been fatal fatal because getting in and taking it out was in a place that nobody was willing to touch and probably more riskier than just letting the tumor uh, cycle play out a malignant tumor is what spreads to uh, surrounding areas it, it starts to invade other areas, and it usually results when other cells travel to other organs, say like in the lungs or where, think of organs where a lot of blood goes through. If you've got tumors in that area and they become malignant, which means they're able to spread and invade, it'll be, they can be picked up in a blood cell and transmitted to other areas. They had a, uh, like I've known, I've known some people personally, my grandfather was one of them, that started off with lung with a lung mass, a tumor in the lungs. And all three of these particular people did not know that they had lung cancer until they had a problem with neurological functions. Uh, I know one had a, uh, he had a seizure, never had a seizure before he was in his sixties. When they had uh, first thing they do when they do a seizure, they do a CT scan of the head if you've never had one, or they should do one. Uh, and it come to find out he had a brain tumor. And when they got to looking at where it came from, it had come from the lungs. I worked with a dispatcher one time, and I know she smoked like a, she smoked real bad, uh, had a bad cough. I'd known her for a lot of years and I always thought to myself, I might want to go up and lecture people. I figured, hey, you, you know better, you don't. It's your business. I don't lecture, but I always thought, man, I'd hear her cough, and I thought, man, that sounds so bad. You know, there's got to be something going on with her inside. Uh, she was on the radio one morning dispatching, and she started, I mean, just had some radio traffic coming out that made no sense at all. And uh, then it sounded like her speech was splurred, and I was a supervisor at the time, and I said, okay. I called one of the other guys. I said, hey, go in and see what's going on. And they got off the radio, took her to the hospital because she was acting like she had a stroke. And what had happened was she had had some major, uh, that cancer had already took over her lungs, got in the bloodstream, and it was in the brain as well. So 
when it's in areas like that, it can get spread out. The kidneys are another area that it can uh, get into the bloodstream and go to other areas to where uh, the lungs probably could have dealt with those cancers for a while longer. But when it gets into the brain, there's no place else for it to go but spread and start to st uh, crush those, the brain matter and spread out in there. So when it gets to be like that and it spreads out, when it spreads to other organs, it's what it becomes. It's called metastasis. That's not easily controlled because it starts getting in other places. Usually stage four is when it's in other places of the body. Stage three is when it starts to develop from one organ to another. Stage two is when it gets on out of its its uh, cell membrane, invading other cells. And then cell one is usually, stage one is pretty much when it's local to a, a very locally confined. So, uh, Malignancy, that's when the gene starts to mutate. And these modified genes, they're not normal anymore. They start, it's what they call uh, oncogenes. O-N-C-O. -O. Anytime you see that prefix, that's going to mean cancer. You've got oncologist, uh, oncogenic. But anytime you see that, there is a, uh, it means it has some type of a cancerous effect. The uh, cancer often begins where the cells divide, that deep into uh, the stru cell structure itself to where they divide. The presence of these tumor cells, it, a lot of times what it does, it, they'll get there, they're alive, they have to, they form their own blood supply many times. The, the blood vessel, different blood vessels that serve the, the tumor itself will start to form. They, uh, they start to change over time as they grow. They gradually resemble normal cells less and less. They start to not look like what's around. It's kind of like uh, when they check for cervical cancer and they do a pap smear in females. They look for cells that are not the same as others. So a phrase that uh, I'll be teaching a lot later is you may not always know what's wrong with somebody, but you'll be able to tell what's not right. That's like with these cells. When they first see them, the first thing they say, oh, uh, these are cancer cells. They won't say that right off the bat. They'll say, oh, these cells don't look like the others. Let's investigate more. Uh, so these cells, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the presence of tumor cells, like I said, they, they, the blood vessels, and when the blood vessels start to form, that does give them a chance of, of metastasizing to other areas. And a lot of times it'll start causing organ function change if it gets in there. Like we talked about the brain, uh, kidneys. A lot of time you don't notice uh, cancer cells in those areas but until they start to form some kind of damage. Like, for example, if they start to get into uh, the kidneys, they'll start perhaps urine in the blood, I'm sorry, blood in the urine, or back pain that's uh, not really defined. It usually comes on gradual. So that's all at the cellular level, but it can get out of hand and take over a, a complete organism. Now, things that we can control as far as what, which starting to relate a little bit more to cellular use to what, uh, cellular use to what we see in the field. For example, cells have to have glucose and oxygen to survive. So, you know, they get it from uh, organic compounds, which means contain carbon or contain life. But those three oxygens, they have to have they have to have nutrients, oxygen, and glucose to survive. So, we see how this kind of starts coming into play now. But at the cellular level, the process of cellular respiration is called glucolysis. And it talks about the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, which usually gets into some very uh, complex items. But the glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm of the uh, cell. Hey, does uh, somebody got something for me? All 
right. be sure you're unless you're ready to talk be sure your mic is on uh mute because we pick up the background noise is very noticeable <laughs> Glycolysis is a, a function that does not require oxygen, a form of uh, anaerobic uh, metabolism. If oxygen is present in the right amounts for moving gas, you can take over up through using a volume and uh, anybody complaining about it. Hey, uh, Donna? All right. Uh, Some of these I'm gonna skip through a little bit quicker because uh the thing about we'll talk about real quick as far as uh aerobic and anaerobic uh metabolism. Now remember going forward that uh aerobic requires oxygen whereas anaerobic does not and we'll break that down a little bit more when we get into the uh, lactic acid and things of that matter so i want to point that out right quick the uh cell membrane Talk the way this works. Homeostasis is the, all of the organs, systems functioning together to maintain normality, if you will, norm, or normal lifestyle, normal functions, like uh, your blood pressure constantly working to keep your brain adequately refused, your lungs constantly working to keep the blood properly oxygenated. If you start having a problem with one, the others affected as well. It might do something to uh, make up, try to make up for it. Uh, and uh, like if your if your heart cardiac cycle is not functioning like it should be, you might start breathing faster to make up for that. So, cell membrane is the permeability. It allows differences in concentrations between the intracellular and the extracellular environments, and it pretty much semi. Uh, permeability that's how it decides on what gets in and what gets out so first thing we're going to look at is uh in this matter is uh diffusion diffusion is passive now diffusion is a passive movement of a solute that's actually not the water part but a solute that's inside of it, like a, a sodium molecule or a potassium molecule are solutes. So uh, diffusion is when one goes from a higher concentration to a lower concentration until they're equal on both sides. For example, uh, if you have uh, something that is, let's say, or something that is very salty on one side and the membrane is permeable and you've got some water on the other side that's not very, uh, that doesn't have a lot of salt in it, it's going to draw the, the one with the salt in it's going to draw the, the, the other side into it so a lot of those things happen that's passive for example the amount of uh carbon dioxide that remains in arterial blood is almost equal to the the, car, the carbon dioxide that is exhaled so the fusion is what makes it the carbon dioxide move from say like the blood that's the system side of the alveoli across the alveoli into the part that you can ventilate and exhale it out so you're simply uh, equalizing that so now that all of the uh 
carbon dioxide has gotten out of the inside of the alveoli, that's when the oxygen trades places with it. So that's just simply diffusion the way that that, uh, the way gases exchange. Pretty much diffusion has to do a lot with gases as well. Then you've got filtration. It's another method of moving substances. Think for, for example, like the kidneys. The kidney cells remove wastes, urea, and other compounds from the blood, and it uh, you urinate it out. Uh, facilitated diffusion is something like a carrier molecule that moves things in and out of cells. For example, it might already uh, be it might already would move automatically because the uh, solutes on one side is the same as the other. However, if you think of something like uh, like glucose, glucose cannot move across cell membranes by itself. So it has to have insulin to help it. So it's kind of facilitated. There's another way that this works is that uh, Let's see, I'm trying to give an example because it is the movement of a substance uh, against against that. For example, the way uh, a lot of times the way phagocytes, white blood cells work to get rid of the of uh, bacteria. So there's three forms of uh, what they call endocytosis, which means it moves the uh, action inside the cell. The one I'm going to point out here really is the phagocytosis. That's one that, you'll see, that you will see later. And it has to do with simply something engulfing another cell. Say like a bacterial cell, you got a large white blood cell, it will actually eat it. It's kind of like uh, if you think of the Pac-Man game, the old Pac-Man games, to where uh, he would eat the little the little blue guys. I'm sure it's been a long time since I've played that. But that's kind of like what, how phagocytosis works. It eats up. Uh, bad cells. Now, osmosis is something you're going to see a lot more. Something that we deal with. It's uh, it's the movement of a solvent. In other words, the say like the liquid part or the gas part from an area of low to high concentration. It's uh, when you have like too much salt in an area, and on the inside of the vessel, the uh, you have a less containing salt, like salt in your blood is 0.09% saline. So blood inside your cells is that, that's why we give normal saline, 0.09. But if let's say if someone has to start giving, uh, you heard of uh, half normal saline, for example. That's less than half of what normal saline is. So what's that going to do? That's going to nourish cells. That's going to go from... Uh, Inside, the, the IV fluid is low on salt. So the saltier area is going to pull that liquid in. Now, we'll get more into this when we talk about IV fluids, but that's kind of the way the osmosis works. So that's why for lactated ringers, normal saline, it is what we call isotonic, and it's not going to move either side. But if you get something that is uh, very hypertonic, it'll definitely it'll pull fluid out of the cells as well and uh, cause them to collapse even. So the membrane is permeable to the solvent, which is like the liquid part or the gas part, but not to the solute itself. It'll move the fluid out, but leave the uh, solutes behind. Tonicity, it's the concentration of a solute or its ability to draw or give water. For example, let's say you put a isotonic saline. You can see this up in front of us now. Isotonic saline will have will not mess with a normal blood cell. It'll still have its concave uh, shape, donut type shape, disc shape, however you want to call it, and uh, nothing will change places. So let's say if we give uh, D five of half normal saline, which is half of that, let's say 0.45% saline, 
if somebody's severely dehydrated, malnourished, uh, in a weakened state that needs nourishment, hypotonic uh, saline is not going to hurt them. But what it, it, because it draws blood, it draws fluid out of the, like the IV fluid or out of the bloodstream and nourishes the cell with it. But look at what can happen if they get too much. If you have high, it, the, you're going to have more saline and potassium inside the cell than you do that's in the fluid being put in the veins and it's going to draw it in, it can swell and bust. They, they can do that. Uh, that's where people that get overloaded a lot of times with their like pulmonary edema, too much IV fluid, or the brain starts to swell in some patients. Patients with uh, a, a good example is uh, if you've ever heard of water intoxication, you know, it can happen. And it happens a lot in alcoholics that uh, go through the DTs. They're so thirsty and they drink all this water. They actually uh, become overloaded with water and then they'll start getting have an altered level of consciousness. They'll start getting where they don't act right. Uh, brain function's not right. And some of them will go into a coma. And that's because these, these cells, even the brain cells, will, they'll absorb so much of that fluid because they're drinking more water than what they have salt. And the, the cells are going to soak it up. And uh, some of them will actually even burst. On the other end of it, let's say you give, uh, there's some hypertonic solutions out there. Or it could be that the patient has such a electrolyte imbalance that when you start giving saline or more solutes in the vascular system that's in the cell, it will actually cause them to collapse. So uh, that's one reason that, say, like, uh, oh, I'm trying to find an example here that will work with that. But like you know, severe dehydration and uh, they were to drink a lot of sodium. That sodium will cause like the red blood cells to uh, to collapse because it would draw the water out of the cell to where they actually, and that's called lysine. You'll see that term later, but that's what we call lysine. Now the body fluid balance What I'm trying to do is make sure I got my right notes up for you so I don't want to cause confusion because I know this, listen to me, ain't the, right. okay, as an advanced EMT, one of the big things you're going to be doing is IVs and it starts to learn how, that's why we have to think about how the uh, cells work and how they deal with this. Because you don't want to drown somebody with fluids. You don't want them to have an electrolyte shift in the wrong way. So that's why we'll talk about the way intracellular fluid works. And if you remember back on your terminology, intra means within, within. You'll see inter, I-N-T-E-R, that's between. So I'm a, I can't emphasize medical terminology enough. So intracellular fluid means in. You'll see that. You'll see that. From here forward, you'll see, like, if you read, like, on transfers, uh, patients' transfer sheets and stuff like that, look at their lab work, like ICF. And you'll see extracellular fluid. That's the fluid that's on the outside of the cell. For example, uh you know, even a blood cell will have fluid inside it, but outside of that blood cell, in the blood system, you're going to have plasma. That's fluid outside of the cells. It kind of bathes the cells. Interstitial fluid. We talked earlier about how the cell has these little cilia on there, and they want to uh, sweep things by. Well, what they're sweeping is that interstitial fluid that's around there. Now, the more hydrated somebody or dehydrated somebody is, the more less of that you're going to have. So. This uh, maintaining this good fluid balance that determines homeostasis, whether things work not, whether you're uh, got high blood pressure, low blood pressure, whether you're dehydrated or hydrated, and that uh, can also bring in 
like the metabolic system or the uh with your glands and your hormones how does all of that play into this now we're starting to see systems tie together for example if you look at the little chart on the side the uh <clears throat> let's look at the brain up here and let's follow it down you got an increase of blood sodium in other words you got getting too much sodium in the in the bloodstream and it affects the brain the brain says hey i got I got some issues up here. So it sends chemicals to the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and it says, hey, here's what we're going to do is uh, I got so much sodium. So let's think about a system. Can you, can you uh, pee sodium out? Not likely. Remember, water is going to follow sodium. And how do you get rid of too much sodium? You, you kind of would equal it out. In this case, here's what uh, the body says we're going to do. So this patient, they, if, even if getting thirsty, your sodium content will go up. Uh, getting dehydrated, your sodium content will go up, or the concentration will go up. Might be the, not the content, but the mole, sodium molecules compared to the water that's around it. So these chemical, these osmoreceptors tell the hypothalamus, they tell the posterior pituitary, hey, we need to secrete ADH or antidiuretic, antidiuretic hormone. Now remember, diuretic means to uh, release fluid. It'll uh, usually be urine. So the antidiuretic hormone is released in the bloodstream and it's transmitted to the kidneys. And it tells the kidneys, hey, we need you to start increasing water reabsorption. In other words, do not give off any water. We need to retain as much as we can to equalize this high concentration of sodium. And how do you know you're getting to this point? The color of your urine is a big uh tail for it the darker it gets when i worked offshore rigs and out west we had a a color urine chart above the urinals in the restrooms and it says hey if your urine is this color you need water so what happens is is it's keeping the water but you're releasing all of the solutes in it all the poisons are still being released so without water they get darker and darker and darker and to the point you can start peeing blood that way because there's it's retaining all the water it's starting to give off other uh issues so if that's happening, the water keeps getting your urine keeps getting darker and darker to that point, you're looking at kidney damage because it'll start messing with the kidney cells as well. Uh, now we're going to move in to some organ systems. Organ is composed of at least two kinds of tissues to perform a complex. You got 12 major organ systems in the body. And a uh, review of those is the integumentary, probably one of the most largest complex at your skin. Your skeletal, muscular, nervous, endocrine, circulatory, lymphatic, immune, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive systems. Uh, some people have favorites over others that what they'd like to study. There's actually specialists out there you know, it's hard to find a doctor anymore that does all organs. Everybody wants to, uh, seems like they want to specialize. You know, your your left hand hurts. Uh, they may want to send you to a left hand doctor. I'm exaggerating, but it's getting to be that way. So this is a picture, maybe hard to see on this slide. However, uh, you need to look at it in your materials. But it breaks down what the functions are of these areas, like respiratory, urinary, what they do for it, the digestive system. The cardiovascular system is one of my favorite systems to study. As a as uh as advanced EMTs, you're gonna be able to do a lot for trauma, malnourishment, dehydration, and things like that with the fluids. Uh that's all I as a paramedic could do for it. But when I get into the cardi cardiovascular system, I can really start doing some things for that. So uh, the uh, 
well, this regulates the pH concentration, the ion concentration, the temperature. All of these work together to maintain homeostasis. When we uh, go into uh, some of the functions of some of the IVs and drugs and stuff we're going to be using later, you'll see how these organs really work out a lot better with that. So the skeletal system, this is what gives us our form, helps us to be uh, recognized as a, uh, a human being. Uh, of course, the bones are the major structure. People get ligaments and tendons confused sometimes, but uh, ligaments, they connect bone to bone, tendons, muscle to bone. Uh, and of course, the cartilage is a cushion or a spacer, kind of uh, what's left over material that they need to get it uh, to keep things together. The uh, some injuries that happen to like a strain or a muscle pull, that's when a, a muscle is torn. Uh, you get the worst ones you can get is like a sprain to a ligament to when that that uh, tissue is torn and it usually bleeds. It causes swelling. It takes longer to heal usually for that to happen. And uh, the connective tissue that are like between the cartilage around the ends of the bones, that is uh, it contains a, a viscous lubricating type fluid. Now, the you might remember how many bones they are in the body. We'll talk about that in a minute. You know, 206 when you're born, or 330 something. It's because they hadn't all uh, fused together yet. So, bones are classified according to their shape. Long bones. Long bones are. Uh, Actually, they have, uh, we'll talk about the diaphysis and the epi and epiphysis here in a little bit, but uh, long bones are your, as you can see, that's up on the board for that, but your femur, your humerus, even the phalanges are considered long bones. That's the bones of your finger because they actually have uh, the diaphysis on one side, the epiphysis that, uh, that uh, determines the width. It's still considered a long bone, even though it's in the bones of the hand. Now you got short irregular bones in the wrist and the ankles, flat bones, skull, ribs, sternum, scapula. There's some irregular bones out there that have specific functions, say like uh, you the hyoid bone. Long bones consist of a. Let me see if I got a picture of it. Long bones have the sh the shaft is the diaph the the. Different ways to pronounce this. It's it's either way is right. I say diaphysis. Some people may call it different. Maybe I've heard orthopedists call it different. The uh, epiphysis is the widened part at the top. Metaphysis is between the shaft and when it starts to uh, widen to the epiphysis or the head. The uh, the periosteum. Or the the, epi, the epiphysis. Let's go back to that. That's the go growth plate. Is as you can see down at the bottom of the one on the right, you can actually see a plate that's between, kind of between the joint, the uh, lubricating cartilage on the bottom and on the inside of the bone. There, there's a growth plate right there. So fractures with kids and people that are still growing that's in that area is very potential uh, that they've had a problem with the growth plate. The uh, periosteum is a double layer of connective tissue that actually covers the outside of the bone. As older you get, the more it goes away. It's like a lot of times with little kids, when they break, it won't be a complete break. They'll get like a green stick fracture or uh, if you've ever cleaned a deer or something like that and seen the bone break, uh, there's always like a membrane around there that still holds it together that they got to cut through or it makes the bone material stick together. The end, uh, remember perio, means around the outside. Endo, the endosteum, is the lining of the inside of the bone. Remember, endo means within. There's a uh, natural light. Then inside the uh, diaphysis, the hollow cavity in long bones called the medullary cavity, and that's where the bone marrow is. That's where the bone marrow is uh, formed and stored. There's two main types of uh, Bones, there's compact bone, which is mostly solid with a few spaces. Uh, 
ribs are kind of compact. Uh, then you got cancerous bone that has a, it's kind of a network or spongy type area that has a, well, I'm trying to think like some vertebrae, uh, especially. And when uh, people get older, that spongy area gets, gets more and more open. Not a lot of uh, good structure in there. And it, uh, they'll start having like uh, compression fractures of the spine and things and uh, osteoporosis and things like that later on. The uh, the joints simply where two bones come together uh, where they can form articulation. That's simply uh, movement, bone movement. The joints can sense of uh, it, the ends of bones that make up the joint and the surrounding connective and supportive tissue. Now, you look at the knee. Knees, there's a lot that can be damaged in a knee. Some of you probably know that firsthand. Now, as you can see on the one on the right, it looks like that is, uh, if you start to look at these ligaments, the uh, that looks like it is a, I'm trying to see here, this looks like a right leg. And uh, when you learn later, you'll see that the, uh, the fibula connects on the outer side of the leg. So then that way you'll know that that has to be a right leg. Now, if you look at the uh, tendon that comes from the kneecap going back toward the fibula, you'll see that it is broke. So it's some type of a tendon there. That's probably going to be a lateral, a lateral tendon tear or collateral type tendon damage. And you see the ligament that's back behind uh, the one where it's got actually ligament pointing to it. You know, those are external ones. And even on the inside that holds that joint together, that's when you got your uh, your ACL, uh, MCL, all of that stuff that's in the middle there that you can't see from the outside that gets torn because you got these on the outside. You also got them on the inside holding them together. On the one on the left, you got like a, you got some cartilage around there that is fluid filled or cushioned. You got a membrane around it that holds in synovial fluid, like a lubricating joint. This is like a ball joint. Uh, from a car. Sometimes, some of you may have this and you don't even realize it. Uh, you ever notice your legs pop, leg joints, or anything like that? What happens sometimes, especially if you get some wear and tear on them, is uh, you'll see what they call the meniscus in between the two joints on the picture on the left. Sometimes that fluid will actually that little membrane will actually rupture in the back, that capsule will, and that fluid will leak out. And you can actually feel it. It'll feel like a golf ball if you put right behind your joint, your knee joint back there in the back part. And if it feels like a, you got a golf ball in there or something like that, that's what they call a baker cyst. And it's actually fluid that leaks out of there and it forms back there in a pocket. A lot of times they don't do nothing with them, nothing at all. Uh, they usually go away on their own like they came up. But however, they can get to the point to where they cause of uh, irritation or something that makes it repeat and it gets to the point where they can't be uh, go away on its own or absorb by itself. That's when sometimes you might have to get it drained because I've had one for a while that ever six months or so that I got to go in and get that taken care of. Uh, All of that together is called a joint capsule. You got it in your shoulder. You got it in your knees. Uh, like the shoulder, you'll that joint capsule is covered with a, what they call a bursa, and it gets inflamed. You can hear it pop, crack, and uh, it sometimes it loses lubrication, and that's where all that pain comes in. The shoulder joint is another interesting joint as well. So, So the 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 uh, joint capsule, you know, it is a sack. It's a fiber sack. It's very uh, very tough. A lot of time it has to be penetrated. If you've ever had your fluid removed or things like that, you know, it's a heck of a needle that they put in there. A lot of time they have to numb it first. So on the inside of that uh, membrane, it's called a synovial membrane of the joint capsule. Synovial fluid is a term that you'll hear in orthopedist office or later on, or sometimes uh, with rupture joints, you may even see some of that fluid. 
but it's it's actually it's kind of like the oil of it. Uh, the shoulder joint is what we call a ball and socket joint. It simply forms a head into a socket. There's also one on the the hip, and it has to be lubricated. The uh, inside of that cap uh, receiving socket it should be smooth and non-pitting. But as people get over older, a lot of time that cartilage and that synovial fluid will go away, and they'll start having uh, osteoarthritis in those areas. And you don't have to be real old all the time to get that. A lot of time, uh, if you've got joint pain that gets uh, osteoarthritis, sometimes gets better with movement throughout the day. You wake up and it's real stiff. Uh, move around more and more during the day. Sometimes it tends to go away, but that's what causes that osteoarthritis when it starts to lose that uh, uh, lubrication. The uh, shoulder joint touch that the fingers elbows and knees are what we call hinge joints let's see i'm sending somebody a message right here hold on sarah said she can't hear anything let me see Can anybody else not hear me right now? Donna, you can hear all right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, The skeleton is divided into the axial skeleton, which is a skull, spinal cord, or thoracic cage, the spinal cord, kind of the centerpiece of it. The uh, the appendicular skeleton is what's left out from the centerpiece, of course, the arms, the, the extremities. Uh, in the, the pelvis. Now the pelvis, even though it looks like it might be connected to the centerpiece, it's really, it's, that's when the appendicular skeleton starts is the pelvis. So you got the spine and uh, the, the whole verbal co vertebral column. And after that, it's simply the, uh, the pelvis and the legs is part of the appendicular skeleton. The skull itself has a, uh, I was trying to find you a picture or something here, but I couldn't find it. The, the skull has a, a total of 28 bones. And it's got different groups that it's, that, that it's in. You can, it, and uh, when you give reports, you'll see a lot of the drop-down boxes and stuff later on has, uh, it'll have like, uh, the it'll divide up the skull and the face. And it'll say head, skull, face. So, if you stop and look at the, the skeleton, the skull part that it'll talk about would probably be the, uh, is going to be the cranium, the cranium part that you can see in this. Now, one part when we get into doing PCRs, and this has to go with your, your assessment as well, is you may see something that says, I had a cut to the head. Well, let's break it down. Cut to the head. Okay. Break it down. Now we're at on the head. Is it the face? or the, uh, the skull part, that's when you would try to break that down. The uh, bones that are also inside there is the uh, auditory ossicles, which is the, the, the three bones of each ear. The, uh, the slang name for it is the hammer, anvil, and the stapes. The... Uh, After you got the six auditory bones, of course, you got the 22 other bones that uh, comprise the cranium and the face. At the base of the temporal bone is uh, it's where the mastoid starts, like the chewing and the face part, uh, the, the jaw part in itself. The, uh, 
what used to be, if you see the, like the sutural lines, the uh, cranial sutures across the top and across the back, across the side, they have, uh, that's where fontanelles were initially when the, when you were born or when, when babies have, and that closes up and it actually starts to seal and fuse those together. The uh, cranial The cranial vault, like from the top part, is uh, there's actually eight bones that fuse the skull. Now, when we turn it over and look at the underside, it's uh, you'll kind of see how why head injuries just don't work with a with a with a skull fracture inside that area. So, the fibrous tissues get less and less as you get older. Skull fractures become more prominent, more easy. And this is looking from the top down into the skull. Uh, the frontal bone is what is behind your forehead, kind of uh, over your eyes, your forehead behind that. You got sinuses in there. Then uh, this is like looking at the floor. In these areas, it looks kind of rough. And I've got a, a fake skull here at the house. But if you look down in top of that, these areas are kind of rigid. So just think of a lot of brain trauma, shaking back and forth and things like that. And it could cause some damage. And Remember, the top part of this is completely sealed, a complete dome, and not a lot of space to expand or anything like that. So you start looking at uh, like the the sphenoid bone. You know, that's where like the top of your nose is. The uh, then you got below that the optic foramen. That's where your ocular nerves come in. Optic nerves from your eyes. It comes into that area right there. So you know, a good hit to the head. Look at how it can. Uh, cause that nerve to be pinched, not work right. Then you got like the carotid canal. That's where the carotid arteries come through, those little areas like that. So, you know, uh, that could be lacerated with a big time head injury or head impact. It could not last not only carotid artery on the inside, but down the back. People uh, get these uh, cerebral bleeds on the inside of the brain. There's no place for it to expand. And when we talk about head injuries later, I'll show you this again, but you see the foramen magnum at the back. That's where the the uh, spinal cord goes out. That's where the vertebrae start. And that's not a real big area, really. I mean, it's probably the size of your thumb in that. So uh, you get a lot of brain swelling. That's also where the brain stem comes in. You get a lot of brain swelling. Where's it going to go? It's going to go down in that hole, and it's going to press on the, uh, the brain stem, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and that's when it's going to cause all kinds of problems to start. The uh, the facial bones, you really can't tell when you're looking at them from like the outside and stuff exactly where everything is. You get a pretty good idea. But some things that's going to be interesting on this one is you see uh, the yellow part, the yellow structure they call the uh, maxilla. Now, sometimes some car wrecks or hits to the face, it can actually what they call a Lafort fracture. And it's actually where that part separates from the rest of the skull. And it can be it can float around in the face. A lot of times where this is noticed at is when they lay down, they can't breathe. It's because this falls back against their airway. Uh, these people are very, very hard to intubate. They're very hard to get an airway down because that is going to be in the way. It's, uh, if you're able to tell that that's what that is, I've seen it before to where it would move to where uh, the way the person kept an airway was allow them to lay on their side with almost their head tilted down uh, because that held it away from the back of the throat. But a lot of times these patients, uh, they can bleed bad and uh, have to, uh, and, I, and I, like I said, I've seen people awake with them the whole time, but if they get unconscious to the point where you need an airway, just be aware that that, you know, it's it's going to be a problem even for the most experienced uh, provider. The uh, other bone you see in the front, like the frontal bone, the parietal bone in the back, if you look underneath uh, the one that's looking from the bottom up, you see the maxilla, and you see how the deck, it's red in this, it's red in that case. You see how that can separate and uh, really uh, distort your landmarks. The uh, bones of the orbit is which the ones that circ the, the, the around the eye, and they have to contain a lot of padding, like muscles. Uh, the uh, 
fat to kind of pat it. If you can look around some people's eyes, the orbits, and some people have, it looks like their eyeballs are sunk in, especially as they get older so because that fat disappears. And some people, it's really, they'll have a fold on their upper eyelid, or and some of them don't. Some of them might be seeing part of the ball. But that's per individual. But it uh, has a lot of fat and muscle in there that protects that. And uh, there's a lot of nerves in there, too. You know, getting hit in your eyes is one of the most painful areas that you can get hit, hit in because of the nerves there. It hurts real bad. Uh, a blowout fracture is an eye uh, that can happen to the eye of the floor, like a, a boxer's punch or trauma to the face. And what can happen there a lot of time is uh, those uh, sometimes they will be uh, looking in a direction and they can't move their eye. It'll actually pinch that muscle at the bottom of it. So uh, like one eye might move and the other one might not, or you try to get them to follow you and you got trauma to the face. And it could very well be that, that they've got a blowout fracture in that orbit to where uh, it just won't move, uh, fixed gaze or something like that. But sometimes they actually leak the blood and the fat from around there. The eyeball can actually be ruptured. Now, the fluid if it leaks out of the big globe itself, a lot of times it can be uh, replaced or substituted. But if the fluid leaks out in the cornea part between the iris and the cornea in that area, it is irreplaceable. Once it's gone, it is gone. Now, the uh, nasal cavity, you know, the... the the structural part of the nose that you see, that's cartilage. You can move it around. And sometimes you can see up in there. You ever notice how somebody, maybe yourself even, you can look up in there and you can see one nostril good, but the other one, it looks like it's got a, a wall in there. If you look at that septum in the middle, a lot of times it's deviated. It's twisted to where you're looking at actually the side of it. Now, those uh, other curvy structures that you see on the right and the left, it kind of looks like a... Uh, like a some type of an onion or something hanging down and on up there you got those others those are bone structures that are inside the nose over time they can enlarge and uh, get distorted or unaligned makes it hard to breathe and if they do any like a septoplasty or rhinoplasty that's when they go in there and actually file them bones down uh, in order to make it easier to breathe i've had the septoplasty before let me tell you it's a rough it's a rough surgery uh and they go in there they uh, uh narrow those down and it heals back over it and uh sometimes it gets easier to breathe like that but it only lasts about four years it's got to be done again i just don't think i'll go through it again uh if any of y'all ever have sinus issues stuffed up nose and things like that you know how frustrating that is if uh you have the sinoplasty or the septoplasty and they clean a lot of that out some people actually have to have sedatives because of uh they get used to it because there's so much new space in there that they can't uh uh let's see somebody's still having problems i'm not sure what's sarah's like it's like i'm not even talking huh must be a problem on her end But uh, it's called an empty nose syndrome uh, because uh, of the all the new space in there that they're not used to. It, it actually freaks some people out, and uh, it uh, you know it's like I said. I don't know if you'll come across something like that. It's just kind of FYI. No medical knowledge is wasted. So. Uh, the other thing is, is that the nasal septum is between there. Sometimes it can be broke or it can be split. Uh, it can be curved, or if you look inside, you can only if you can see up one nose and not the other. It's probably because the septum is deviated. And on either side of that, you got the paranasal sinuses. Uh, they're up at the top of the forehead. They're on either side. Those are supposed to be open and contain some mucus and stuff for cleaning and uh, cleansing out. However. If they're not able to drain and get stopped up, then they can, you know, result in some type of an infection. Uh, hey, the mandible is a lower jaw, big jaw bone. It's uh, joined at the back uh, onto the skull. Uh, the 
temporal muscles on the side of the head is what open and close it. Now, you remember this uh, picture of the skull? There is no openings in that skull from the outside. Growing up, I was always told, hey, if you get shot in the temple, that's a soft spot straight through to your brain. Well, that's wrong. That's where the muscle is that opens and closes the jaw. That's not an opening to your head. The hyoid bone, sometimes you can feel it, sometimes you can't, but it's actually at the very base of where the, where like the back of your chin back there joins your neck. Sometimes if you can press on it, you can uh, actually feel yourself start to talk a little bit different. It floats. It's a supporter of the tongue, actually. The, uh, the neck, supported by uh, the cervical spine, of course, but also all of the muscle structures that go around it. They have what helps keep the neck in place. And they can't really, one survive can't really without the other. Some landmarks on this. One of the biggest landmarks you can find at the front of your neck is, of course, your, uh, your larynx, your thyroid cartilage, or uh, the non-medical term is the, the Adam's apple or voice box. Uh, I want you to feel this now, so later you'll know when you get into doing stuff. But like you see the thyroid cartilage, it's where it pokes out the Adam's apple. If you put your finger on the very top of it, you can feel that little V there, like a little opening. Now, if you just take your take the side of your finger and put it on the, the tip of that Adam's apple, and if you'll simply roll your finger down, and where it comes to rest, you'll feel another little notch, and that's called the cricothyroid membrane. That's where tracheotomies are performed through that little, that second, that lower membrane there in the front of that. That's simply where, uh, when the paramedics or someone does a tracheotomy, that's where they insert the needle. They c cut the cartilage there, start to, or either put the needle in and can put an ET tube uh, number three through there to ventilate a patient. But that's where that's done. Uh, also, a trachea is supposed to be midline. That's where you would want to feel and make sure that it is midline. You want to like find the Adam's apple and then go down and feel a lot of times. Sometimes you can feel those cartilage rings down there between those, where those two muscles come together. The muscles on the side of the either side of the neck, the big strap muscle on the side of the neck. If you flex your neck and touch your neck, uh, the front, you can feel where those muscles are on either side of your neck. And that's called the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle. And it's because it connects to the mastoid uh, joint for the jaw and it goes all the way to the sternum so that's why they call it sternocleidoid mastoid why is that important up at the top on the inside of those is where you should be able to feel a pulse the carotid artery uh the large veins are right beside it and uh if you come see where they come down to the front where they join the sternum that is a good landmark some of the landmarks that you need to uh, to feel you can see the hyoid bone up above the larynx up there. It's a bone that looks like a ring around a curtain or something like that, perhaps. The spinal column is uh, five different sections. It uh, supports the body. If you have all of the cartilage and discs and everything in place like that, then everything should work out fine with it. However, as time goes on, uh, those discs may deteriorate, bone might start touching bone, it pinches nerves, and uh, it, could start, it could start to hurt, of course. But the first seven of the cervical, C1 through C7, that's for the, the neck, and, uh, excuse me. All right. Uh, C1 through C7 is the neck. C1... And C2, we'll talk about in depth in just a little bit more because it is important. Your lumbar spine contains uh, 12, and only 10 of them are actually attached to the uh, sternum. So you've got two floating ribs, and only 10 of those ribs attached to the sternum are considered true ribs. And, of course, the next five going down is lumbar spine. They're the thickest and the biggest because they support most of the weight. And the sacrum is... Uh, about five fused vertebrae at the end, and the caustic, they say between two to four, depending on the person. The uh, Let's look at the uh, sternum for a minute. I mean, I'm sorry, the cervical spine. Now, the spinal cord is an extension of the brain. 
it's simply the brain coming out of the skull that sends a nerve pathways uh it receives messages it sends messages all the way down and uh, for each level that it goes down uh of course the least it affects now c1 is called uh the atlas you pretty much break that c1 or c2 they call it a hangman's fracture it's pretty much over with because that pretty much shuts down if, if, if it compresses the spine or severs the spine then just about everything below that is going to be non-functional so the axis is the seven is the second vertebrae c2 and it is what makes lets the head rotate and move the uh c3 c4 you get lower down like that that might start uh getting into like the uh diaphragm muscles of the diaphragm the ribs that help you breathe and we'll get into that more as we uh get into those those systems now again the thorax is 12 ribs that's you got t1 through 3 through t12 and you only have 10 ribs that are attached to the sternum as you can see here that are attached by cartilage and then you have two floating ribs on each side that is not attached is uh as you can see that males and females both have 12 pair of ribs xiphoid process is an important landmark that you look for of course you learn the cpr things like that uh but it's a good idea to uh you can't always feel that with anybody, but it's a good idea to know where that's at. To, uh, to make landmarks, if it's broke off, and you got to worry about like liver, stomach, things like that being lacerated. The manubrium the, is the body of the sternum, and of course the sternal notch up at the top, you can feel that as well. Uh, the What controls the bottom of the thorax is a uh, the thorax is uh, the bottom structure of it. Of course, it's going to be the, going to be the diaphragm. But, uh, of course, the ribs on the outside, the collarbones on the top, that's pretty much confined to where the, uh, the thorax is. The, if you want to look at the area of, uh, as far as, like, for example, the larger structure, of course, inside there is going to be your heart and lungs and your great vessels. Just beneath the sternum, right behind the sternum, about the middle, is uh, the arch of the aorta. It's right at the top part up there. You figure the arch of the aorta and the pulmonary arteries exit in that area. So stab wounds, gunshot wounds into that upper portion on either side of the heart. Uh, you know, it's going to hit some very, very lethal structures if, uh, if they get damaged. So knowing your anatomy and where that stuff is, and when we break down the chest a little later, you'll see it a little bit, you'll see that better. All right, we're starting to get into a little meat now. Uh, on the right side, the uh, you see how big the lungs actually are and how much of the of, that they take up. It's not only from side to side. But the lungs go from the front of the chest all the way to the back as well. So there's some very big structures. The uh, you know you can have a pneumothorax, an open pneumothorax to the back as well as you can to the side or to the front. Now the lungs do go up pretty high to just behind the collarbones. And as you can see, if you put your arm down, it's only about mm, it's not even to the, all the way to the bottom of your rib cage to where the lungs will end on either side. The uh, Right lung has three lobes, the left lung has two lobes. They'll break those down later as well. But as you can see that the diaphragm separates the thorax from the abdomen. That's uh, the that sheet muscle. And you can see the muscles that are attaching the bottom of the diaphragm, uh, attach the bottom of the uh, diaphragm down to the, to the bones down there. And that's when you, when they breathe, when you inhale, that pulls down, it causes the chest, uh, to expand and it pulls the air in and you can see where the heart is behind that the uh the uh, pulmonary arteries the aorta pulmonary veins the great vessels of the neck how they actually go out and uh alongside of the into the each of the arms the uh 
We'll talk about after a while the plural lining and the visual lining. It'll be very important. But right now, I want you to see these spaces in here. You, those spaces are potential spaces. You're not able to see them because they adhere right next to the structure above them. This uh, diaphragm is going to be right up next to these lungs. There's really not going to be a space there, but it's a potential space. Blood and air can gather in there and form a space. That's when you start having like a pneumothorax or a uh, hemothorax of that matter. Also, has anybody ever heard of uh, pleurisy? If you've ever had it before, it usually happens on the side of the lungs along the chest wall. And that's where it loses lubrication and it starts to hurt. It can also happen on the bottom of the lung. So sometimes people will get unexplained pain that they don't know if it's in their chest or if it's in their abdomen. Uh, but it can, uh, you know, it, we won't be able to determine in the field what it is. Might have a good idea, but for, but it could be some pleurisy on the bottom side of on the or on top of the diaphragm that makes them feel like they're having a heart attack or a gallbladder problem or something like that. So just keeping back in your mind that that always could happen. Also since we're looking at the bottom of the diaphragm like that, when you bleed internally, remember going forward that when blood is not where it's supposed to be, it hurts. When blood is out of the vascular system, it hurts. If you get a, a cerebral bleed, you know, they say it's the worst headache of your life. Uh, if you bleed into your abdomen from uh, internal bleeding as far as uh, intestines or anything like that, uh, the, ab the lining of the abdomen finds that blood very irritable and it starts contracting it gets rigid also like ectopic pregnancies and things like that where there's blood inside the abdominal cavity if they're lying flat and that blood gets up to the diaphragm it irritates that phrenic nerve and it'll cause the shoulders to hurt so abdominal a big punch to the abdomen can cause shoulder pain because of the the pain being referred when the blood touches the diaphragm because of this follows those nerve pathways but like I said, we'll talk more on that later. I just wanted to show you that while I had that picture. Uh, the the rectus skeleton down a little bit more. The appendicular skeleton is uh, shoulder girdle. As you can see for that, it's all made up of the clavicle, the acromion process, and the head of the shoulder. Now, what forms uh, that is uh, the shoulder joint is actually is where it attaches to the glenohumeral humeral joint. That's what it's actually called. And you'll see that later. Uh, I think some of the quizzes. The shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint. The humerus articulates with the glenoid fossa. fossa. And that's simply uh, that lubricated area to where it uh, accepts the head of that humerus, the glenoid fossa. Now, as you can see where a broke collarbone can affect that, a broke scapula can affect that. Uh, a shoulder can come dislocated where the tendons get loose and the ligaments get loose and they're not able to hold that shoulder in place. And that ball and socket will actually hang down and you can see a big indentation in there and everything like that. So that's uh, knowing where those points are on your anatomy. Upper extremities is the... Uh, consists of the arm, the forearm, the wrist, and the fingers, of course. And uh, the humerus, the large bone, it's the second largest long bone in your body. Of course, the fingers are the first. It uh, contains a lot of blood vessels. It contains a lot of marrow, a lot of blood in there if it was to get broke. So you can see where your biceps are, where they connect down to uh, your radius and your ulna. Remember that uh, your radius is on your thumb side. Remember the radius is it? Uh, radiates around, it pivots around the old, the ulna. The uh, abursa, oh, sorry, I hit myself. The, uh, if you look back now, in some areas, advanced EMTs do uh, easy IOs in interosseous infusions and uh when we get into that we'll do a lot more regional anatomy on it but that's, that's simply going to go for they'll be drilled into the area of the shoulder right up where the muscle starts up there right at the insertion right above that insertion of where the uh biceps brachia are and that's where that that will go in and then inside that bone there's a lot of vessels 
and it goes directly to the heart like that. So that's uh, an area that you'll be getting familiar with later when we do go over that material. Now the forearm and wrist, you got a lot of bones inside there. Now the the bones are the fingers, and the the which are the phalanges, metacarpals. Those are actually long bones because you can see they have the uh, diaphysis, they have the epiphysis, they have those structures. Those are actually considered long bones. Now, uh, even though they're short, now the, now the carpal, the carpal bones are short and irregular bones. So that's where those come into play. But it's, a lot of people don't realize that the phalanges are long bones. The pelvic girdle. That's man, you got a lot of uh, blood vessels in there and a lot of uh, tightly knit structures. It takes a lot of force to break a pelvis. So the uh, inside these bones here, you've got it's a it forms a ring. It's kind of like uh, you see that's like given birth that goes uh, that provides space for the baby to come out. It also uh, provides a space for uh, your uh, pelvic cavity organs can rest down in there. It has uh, the, the big opening that you see in the middle of the pelvis, like where the baby and stuff comes out. It's called the, the obturator foramen, and it's the opening between the ilium and the pubis that you can see right there in front. The pelvic girdle supports pretty much the weight of the whole body and, of course, the, uh, the organs and the systems that are stuffed inside of it. The uh, Vessels inside of the pelvis, you, you can see the inferior vena cava and the ascending aorta. Now, uh, I had a uh, guy that was uh, hit by a car the other night, and he actually had a tear in his inferior vena cava. Uh, he had a lot of multiple organ damage, but he had a tear in his uh, vena cava. Thank goodness it wasn't the, uh, the artery. It was still bad. But the you know the artery would have bled out much faster. But with uh, it being the vena cava, you know it was venous, and they was able to uh, go up and do some surgical repair. However, that was a pr pretty good lick that he took in order to tear that. Uh, a pelvic fracture, just the fracture itself, it had got so much vasculature in there. You know you're looking at losing a minimum of, of a, a liter to two liters of fluid, probably at minimum, just for an average size of adult for a suspected pelvic fracture. So those people, you know, they need to get uh, some fluid resuscitation they need to be uh, to a surgical center, a trauma center. But those people can, uh, they can die on you in a hurry because it, that is a, a pelvic fracture is considered what we call like an alpha patient or a level one trauma activation. The lower extremities, of course, we're talking about the hip, uh, thigh, knee, the uh, lower leg. And as you can see, the humerus has a head. Head of the humerus is like a ball and socket. It's also a ball and socket joint of the hip. The uh, the lower area of the uh, femur. This is going to be the is another area that we can do interosseous infusions into, and we'll show, get into that later. But you can drill inside there because the inside of this is full of vascular tissue, bone marrow. Uh, blood forming structures and it has it can get into the uh blood system and actually they say anywhere from seven to ten seconds as far as getting into the central circulation you know getting into there uh the tibia and fibula now the uh if you have trouble getting those separated tibia it's kind of backwards in a way the tibia is a bigger bone, smaller word. And the fibula is a smaller bone, but it's a bigger word. Uh, the tibia, if you remember that in the front, where did you start uh, an eye at in the tibia? You got to remember the tibia tuberosity. That's for that's how you can remember that it is going to be the front bone. So uh, the patella, the kneecap. Everybody, if you ever had a patella dislocated, it is very painful. It's only supported. It's really not joined to a bone. It's only supported there by a, uh, a ligament called the patellar ligament. These are a little bit better pictures of that. You can see the patella is inside that ligament. And uh, when it's not in the right place, it hurts. It hurts bad. This is a front view of all of the tendons and the structures of uh, the 
helps hold that knee together. As you can see all the multi uh, tendons in there. Earlier we talked about a medial collateral ligament that was torn. Now you can't see the inside ones here, but uh, you can see the collateral ligaments. You can see the ligaments coming from that supporting the uh, from the outside of the quadriceps. It, uh, you got some ligaments around there that goes down and inserts into the muscles of the lower leg as well. Very complex joint. And it's, uh, it's a lot of times with the injuries of that joint, if they got circulation to the foot, they really don't want you to try to manipulate it because of all the nerves and stuff in there that could go wrong. Just simply uh, sp splint it in the position found and uh, get them to the hospital. Now, if it is, uh, as we'll talk later, if there's a problem with circulation, then you might have to uh, manipulate in order to get it circulation in the right place. So uh, the ankle again, a lot of uh, bones and structures in the ankle. It's uh, it goes it goes through an enormous amount of stress and workload. The uh, along the bottom of this down here, you can see a tendon that goes from the fr front to the uh, front to the back. That's called the the plantar fascia. And if you've ever had plantar fasciitis or anything like that, you know how bad that hurts. You can also get inflammation of the uh, tendon on the, the Achilles tendon on the back. It causes severe ankle pain. Uh, it'll hurt on the bottom of the foot. And those are, that's why you really need to take care of your feet. Good shoes, good uh, arch supports, good, uh, good ankle support. But being in this type of work, you need to have a good set of shoes and spend the money on them because, you know, you only get one set. But once you start having those problems with your feet, they can last a long, long time. Now, some of the physiology, uh, skeletal system physiology, pretty much uh, what are the functions of it? The bones, the main, they're there to protect and to provide structure. Uh, they help you move. They have to work in conjunction with the uh, skeletal system in order to be able to move. Some bones are, they use calcium, and they create structure that's hard and resilient. Uh, bone cells, like I said, they probably they live a long time. They don't grow that fast. That's why it takes a bone so long to heal. They, uh, they're a collagen type material. A lot of it is, uh, very few cells just spread out and uh, because they're made of minerals too, like hydroxy, uh, uh, epitite, uh, calcium, there's coll collagen fibers in the bone. They uh, lend flexibility to strengthen bones. So bones are, it's kind of like you've seen cement that requires reinforcement, if you will. The uh, bones also create red blood cells. That, uh, and other types of blood cells, but mainly the red blood cells. And uh, they do require blood supply. Bones have to get a lot of blood. They got, and they've got nerves that are in some of the bones. That's why they hurt so bad that when they, uh, when they break, they also, uh, like for example, bone cancer, it goes unnoticed for a while until it starts to get into some structures and cause a lot of pain, but it can be a very, very painful type. And, One reason bone cancer can be drug out so long and, and painful is, uh, you know, bones are other than you, you start having problems if it starts getting into the marrow and things like that, of course, with the red blood cell production. But a lot of times there's just nothing there to eat away to kill you until it gets it, uh, in a real bad type uh, metastatic form. So, uh, it, you know, it can be pretty agonizing with that. So the uh, next part is the musculoskeletal system. I'm talking about a little bit of, of anatomy for that. It is that, you know, your bones can't work right if you don't have the muscular system to, uh, to hold them together, to uh, give them the uh, stability that they need, help hold them together kind of like under tension, make a move. There's over 600 bones in the body. They have, uh, they've got voluntary and involuntary functions, like uh, muscles that are on the outside of the uh, skeletal system. You know, you've got smooth muscle, which is pretty much, uh, 
involuntary of the stomach, blood vessels, inside the intestines. You really don't have any control over that. Then you've got cardiac muscle, which is, uh, it has its own functioning system. It can, it has its own automaticity, which is it can generate electrical impulses and contract on its own without stimulating uh, impulses from the outside. So skeletal muscle is called striated muscle. It is, uh, for the most part, voluntary. Like you move your arm when you want to. You control moving your arm, your legs, and most of the skeletal muscle. However, there is sometimes to where, like a reflex that that happens to where you don't even think about. Like uh, if you were to touch a hot stove, a lot of time you'll pull your hand back without even realizing that you'd even done so. Uh, kind of a reflex. Sometimes it can have, uh, a, you know, a pretty much involuntary function. So. Uh, that's more developed than adults than it is kids. That's why, hence, that sometimes kids will get uh, burnt a lot of times by some reason because they don't, their system's not developed enough for their body to say, oh, there's a problem, get off there now. And they'll, they'll actually get burnt more from it. So uh, muscles have to be used. They have to be uh used or they go away. For example, when you work out, exercise, walk, your muscles uh, tend to stay in shape. They uh, That keeps your muscles uh, big and functioning, but when you don't use, it goes away. Muscles that are not used will atrophy. That's why a lot of times in these nursing homes or people who are out of shape or don't exercise, you know, you'll see bone structure, but You'll see the bone formation, but not much curves or uh, muscle structure around it. And like a lot of people in the nursing homes, they'll have like muscular atrophy. And uh, or a term for that is disuse atrophy. If you don't use something, it will go away. Uh, so it's and also muscle burns calorie. The more muscle you got, you know, the more calories you're going to burn. So and your metabolism goes up the more muscle that you have. So. Uh, most muscles in the body they actually operate on a uh, what they call a, a antagonistic pairs. For example, like uh, your bicep curves, your tricep extends, your your tricep flexes, your bicep. Uh, Extend. So you think about different muscles to do that. You know, your th you, you, even your femur, your thigh, your leg muscles, uh, your wrist muscles. So if one of them extends, the other one has to pretty much ex uh, flex in order for it to work. So the uh, physiology of the muscles, uh, you know, it, it does start to get complex. Whereas you have over 600 muscles. This uh, over 600 of them, and a lot of you probably don't ever use until you end up doing a sprain or something like that. So that is, uh, and th they'll show up because if they don't get used, they, lo they lose their strength. They don't have the tonicity that they need to have. So uh, instead of them able to fight back, if you will, a lot of times they'll tear or strain, especially uh, working in an area or working a muscle that you haven't worked it with in a long time. Because what happens is if you work it, work it, work it, uh, you know, it builds up lactic acid. The acid tears down muscle. And when that happens, it hurts. That's why after a workout or after work, it hurts. So, uh, you know, muscles, what makes you to be able to manipulate or move about your environment. It, uh, muscles also, have a protective measure as far as like your, your abdominal muscles, uh, your your muscles on the side. They protect uh, your abdominal organs on the inside. And they also help the bone protect because they keep bone at structure. Like the rib cage depends on the intercostal muscles in order to help keep them aligned and keep them in shape. The muscles also uh, are a source of energy. They, uh, they have ATP. That's for short-term contraction. Now, you can... Uh, you might can jog or walk for a long period of time because you stay in aerobic uh, respiration when that happens. Your muscles are able to still use them. They're not getting used that fast, so they're able to use the oxygen to convert it to energy. However, 
uh, you can't sprint that long. Your muscles will deplete uh, the oxygen in there, and then when it turns to ATP, that's only for a short time. Even a, a cheetah, a th the big cat in Africa, is supposed to be the world's fastest lamb mammal. They say they can go 70 miles an hour, but only for like a minute, and that's it. And after that happens, they catch what they got to get, and they crash for a while. But they said they only have, you know, that's only for short term. Nobody can exist in a sprint for that long. Uh, one of the most exhausting things you'll do is uh, probably get in a fight with another person because you not only do you expend, uh, you know, you got your adrenaline flow and you're expending a muscle injury, but it's very exhausting. So I like with professional sports, a lot of times those, uh, you know, three minute, you know, three minute round or so because the, they deplete their uh, ATP store so quick. Now, uh, Oxygen is a similar to glucose. I mean, you got to have oxygen for things to work. You got to have oxygen to break down glucose in, in the inside the cells. So oxygen and glucose has to go together. If one or the other is depleted, you got problems. What happens when you have a person that don't have the needed amount of glucose in their blood? You know, they're unconscious. What happens if you have a person without the needed oxygen in their blood? It's usually unconscious. So it takes both of them. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, your brain cells need oxygen. I mean, glucose, almost as bad as it needs the oxygen. It can't last as long without the oxygen as it can the glucose. But uh, somebody that's been without with hypoglycemic for a long period of time, you know, they, they got to be considered for brain damage as well because, uh, you know, I've seen people who wake them up with an amp of D50. And how long have they been like it? I don't know. They need to be evaluated because, as you you can see now, that, that without lack of glucose, they can have permanent brain damage. Uh, so they, they don't need to be just to let go. A lot of times people get that and get a refusal and then leave for it. Now, uh, sensation of muscle occurs. Uh when the energy supply is depleted. And what that simply means is uh, you, you can feel the muscles get sore quickly because it starts to tell the nerves, it's you know, it's, a, it's sending a messenger to, uh, to the to the brain says, hey, we're not getting, uh, we're not getting the, the oxygen and the glucose down here. So they start hurting. Uh, muscles fatigue pretty quick and it takes a lot out of you. And, uh, then it'll start trying to break down muscle tissue and it'll start getting into the, the Krebs cycle to break down uh, and start using uh, lactic acid. Then they can start getting real painful. So there's a, a, a pigment in the, uh, looking for the pigment thing for you. There's a pigment that's in the blood called, uh, It's circulated by the blood. It's called myoglobin. It's given to the muscles, and it gives them a color. It's a red-brown color, and it's called it's you know getting blood there. It's getting nutrients, and a lot of time when that pigment is uh, that myoglobin is missing, it'll start getting pale, you know, uh, pale muscle, ineffective muscle. If you think back about like uh, if you think of veal, uh, veal cuts of meat, how that is, it's because it's been starved of those uh, nutrients. Lactic acid, it can accumulate in the muscles uh, when this oxygen debt runs low. That lactic acid, will, it, it's, it's acid burns, it deteriorates, and it deteriorating your muscles like that, it's what causes them to hurt. Now, it can get into the bloodstream. Now, lactic acid can get to a point where we talk about organ failure later on, it can actually, your lactate can get to a point where it can actually kill somebody. Uh, there's been... You've heard these odd stories of where somebody do uh, this real fast workout. The the term escapes my mind right now, but they would do these real powerful workouts that weren't used to them and end up in the hospital because uh, their muscles were broke down so much and that lactic acid got into their system that it actually caused kid, kidney failure because so much lactic acid got into their bloodstream that it was starting to deteriorate the uh those fine muscle, those fine cells in the kidneys, so it actually causes them to have kidney failure. So, uh, the 
the respiratory system, the uh, you got your upper airway, anything that's used to get air into your system. Uh, upper airway, lower airway. You know, upper airway is everything above uh, above the larynx, nose, mouth, tongue, jaw, your uh, pharynx. You start your Adam's apple from your Adam's apple up or larynx up. That is your upper airway. So sounds uh, that happen up here, it has to come across your vocal cords. So, uh, you know, your voice, uh, grunting, things like that, or noises that are heard in the upper airway, and it's just because it's coming across that. The uh, tongue is in there. It's a large muscle. It's attached to the mandible and the hyoid bone. It actually uh, plays a part in airway control, uh, phonating words. The uh, the nostrils, I don't know about y'all, but I can't stand it when my nose is stopped up. I mean, it's, one, it's very aggravating, and it uh, it's, uh, you know, it's tough to deal with, but that can also happen with fractures, secretions, and things like that. Olfactory uh, receptors are located in the uh, nasal cavity. That has to do with smell. Your olfactory bulbs are pretty large sensory organs in your up in your nose and what's odd is i've heard people saying that they uh got knocked out and they remember a funny smell in their nose or i've, I've heard of people like in car wrecks that have it uh, people that heard that uh that boxers said that they remember getting a hit to the head and they had this strange smelling sensation and what that is is those olfactory bulbs it looks like the end of two q-tips if you would up in there and uh, when they get jarred, even if they don't sense a smell, but if they get jarred, they actually create a stimulation that, and it makes you feel like you smelled something. So that was kind of, I thought that was kind of fascinating to hear about that. So uh, down, further down, the uh, you got two, let me see if I can get a picture of this for you. All right, this might be better. As you go down from the nasal cavity, the pharynx, you'll see the epiglottis. And it's simply, that is a, uh, it looks like, I'm trying to find a good pronunciation for you. The, uh, it almost looks like a, pig, a pig's ear that lays over top of the vocal cords when you swallow. And it is simply a big uh, flap right there. When you, uh, you go to intubate or, or look at airways later, it's when you move the tongue out of the way, you'll see the epiglottis uh laying over the trachea and that is to guard food from going in there when you when you swallow so the uh when you go to intubate someone you stick that blade in there and you lift up the epiglottis so you can see in the vocal cords and that's where you put your tube but the epiglottis is simply that the uh it, it almost looks like a leaf or i tell people hey the best thing it looks like it looks like a big old pig's ear down there and you have to pick it up to see down into the airway uh then the shield shaped kind of thyroid cartilage which is your larynx or voice box if you will that is uh that houses your vocal cords your thyroid cartilage and below that is where the lower airway starts now again looking at the the whole structure here down in the bottom you see the alveoli which is at the very end of the lungs uh you got those are so small they look like clusters of grapes and they look like should look like individual grapes and that'll play that'll come in to handy later but then you got the capillary network that that wrap around it and the, they're these you know very small structures where the capillaries they take out uh oxygen coming into the alveoli take it into the blood and then they they trade it for carbon dioxide and we'll talk about the physiology of it later I'll, exp I'll explain that to you uh but the uh up above like i said that is the upper airway everything above the larynx the lower airway below the larynx that's the trachea the bronchi lungs that's where gas exchange takes place uh it's a very uh terminal ends of the lungs and the alveoli but you can see on the right hand side is the larynx you've got your thyroid cartilage your cricothyroid membrane that's the membrane that you'll that you locate uh when doing a uh 
a needle tracheotomy. And you see down at the bottom of the lungs, which control, which are the, is the bottom of the thorax, that expand and deflate the lungs. The place to where the, uh, it's usually around the fifth vertebrae, but where the trachea separates into two, two bronchi, this right here is called the carina. And uh, you'll hear, hear that term a lot of time when they look at an x-ray. You know, the carina is uh, it's where it bifurcates. Uh, and when they look for like a, for a, an endotracheal tube, intubation it'll go into the trachea but it don't need to go too far down either one of those because then you only do one inflating it and what they'll do is they'll take an x-ray to measure it and they'll say well it is about two centers meters above the carina which means it'll be about right in here but that junction there is called uh of course the carina the uh The lungs, the one on the right contains three lobes, the one on the left contains two. Uh, one idea is, hey, maybe it's because the heart turns that way, but otherwise uh, there's really no sound reason for it other than that's, that's the way that it's always been that way. So these are the, the breathing organs of the body. They have a tissue around them, like a small, like a, it's a very thin membrane, almost like the lung is inside of a bag, and that is called the uh, pleura. You also have pleura. It's kind of like a saran wrap that lines the inside of the chest cavity. It lines the diaphragm, and each lung is enclosed in one of those. So the, the uh, pleura that goes around the lungs is called visceral, the visceral pleura. Anytime uh, something affects the organ itself, it's called visceral. So you've got the visceral pleura around there, and uh, the parietal pleura is the pleura that uh, surrounds the inside of the chest cavity. Now, in between those, you have a potential space. You're not supposed to have a space at all because it's separate, but it has a lubricating fluid in there. And uh, it performs a viscosity to where they lubricate back and forth and move. However, if you have a hole in the chest or a hole in the lung and air escapes and gets between those two spaces, then you start developing uh, a space, a pleural space. And that's what they call uh, like a pneumothorax. That's when the, the air or blood gets in between those two spaces there. So anytime, remember, parietal has to do with the outside. You'll have, uh, we'll talk about inside the abdomen later, but parietal has to do with the outside and visceral has to do what's up against the surface of the lungs itself. Now, the main muscle that makes you breathe, of course, is the diaphragm. But, and you can control breathing, and also it can control itself. So it has an involuntary and voluntary uh, mechanism. Other muscles that control it are the, uh, the muscles of the ribs, the intercostal muscles, because they simply, uh, you know, if you take a breath, you can feel your uh, lungs expand out. And a lot of times, some people can't get enough air in by their uh, diaphragm breathing alone, so they have to go to uh, using their chest muscles, called using the accessory muscles. You know, sometimes even using abdominal muscles to pull it in. So the diaphragm should be the only thing that they use under normal circumstances. But when they start using uh, chest muscles, the muscles uh, around the collarbones, you can see that, or abdominal muscles in order to breathe in and out, then you know this person's going to be in, uh, be in sad shape. Now, uh, <clears throat> during exhalation, the diaphragm, the diaphragm relaxes. In other words, it goes up. When it, it takes energy to make the diaphragm flatten. And if you figure if that diaphragm, which is dome-shaped, if it goes down, it's going to force air to vacuum in. Now, when the diaphragm relaxes, that's passive, it goes back up and, along, and the air escapes to the outside. So, uh, Pretty much shouldn't be a lot of effort as far as normal breathing. When there is a problem with breathing, you need to look for something. I've seen patients crash. The only thing wrong with them that I notice from the outside, and I give this example a lot in my classes, 
is when the vital signs are wrong and the body's trying to tell you something, you better listen to it. This lady was in a car wreck, not any wounds at all to the outside of her body. She actually denied having any pain. She denied being short of breath, but she was breathing 33 times a minute. And I always remember that number, 33, because I kept counting and counting. And I said, ma'am, what's wrong? She's like, nothing. But she was breathing 33 times a minute. She was using, uh, not only was she using, her respirations were getting faster and faster, and she was using accessory muscles. Well, when we got to the hospital, she died because uh, her aorta was transected and her body was compensating, you know, compensated shock until the last minute and it just give out. But her respirations increased. It was involuntary because her body was saying, hey, you need to keep doing this because we're losing blood. So when that respiratory system starts to tell on you, uh, that you, you, you know, you really got to look at what's going on. Do people fake breathing fast or something wrong? Yeah, they do. So a point is, is type, is kind of look if anything distracts them. For example, uh, I've seen people be breathing 50 times a minute, like they're dying. Their cell phone rings, they slow down and talk on it normal, and they start back. You know, I might say, hey, the patient is easily distracted from their problem. However, you know, something like that. Um, someone that is in true respiratory distress, nothing else, I promise you, is going to be on their mind but breathing. Uh, sometimes, uh, you get mucus plugs in there, the uh, mucus glands inside the lungs get full, bronchitis, and that can make them work harder, too, to try to get stuff out as well. So uh, a little bit of the physiology, gas exchanges at the alveolar capillary membrane. It's at the very terminal end of the lungs where those grape-like clusters are. That's where uh, gas exchange takes place. Now, uh, Gas respiration is the gas exchange at the end of the alve alveoli. It is diffusion. It's a simple gas diffusion. Gas dissolving in a liquid and gas is dissolving in blood in this case. You know, oxygen is dissolving in blood and it's given off from the blood to the air CO2. Now, Respiration is the exchange of gases, and I say that because when we tell taking vital signs, we say that we're counting respirations. That's really an untrue statement, but it's been like that for so long we're not going to change it. Ventilation, think of it as a AC guy or AC person, your air conditioning at home. How does the air get from one place to the other? It gets there through a vent. So uh, you got to think of. Uh, Ventilation is the process of moving air in and out of the lungs. Respiration is the process of gas exchange at the end of it. So, and you know, some people do say, hey, blood pressure is this, ventilation is that. So that is the true terms for them. But uh, <clears throat> so because there's so many alveoli in a fairly large space, uh, that's why they're made in clusters to, to expand the surface area, but at the same time, keep it kind of uh, controlled. And it's very delicate tissue. It doesn't take much to, uh, to do that to affect it at all. Kind of a picture of the way it works, as you see over on the other side, the, uh, the systemic is where uh, CO2 and O2 trades places. They don't like each other. Where you got, they have to where you have a lot of CO2, you're not going to have a lot of oxygen. And that kind of makes sense if you think back through the years of being an EMT. Uh, CO2 goes up, you don't have a lot of oxygen. You give a lot of oxygen, you're going to lose CO2. They don't like to be in the same space. Now, when we start talking about uh, the way some of the ventilations and things work like that later, you'll see how that, that works. Uh, if any of you have ever seen uh, ETCO2 monitoring, like on advanced airways where they uh, monitor the ETCO2 that comes out, uh, sometimes you'll have uh, a low pulse ox, but the CO2 be real high. So you're, where one's off, where one's too high, the other one's going to be low, vice versa. Just remember, they don't like each other, and uh, they have to exchange spots. They can't both exist in the same area. The uh,
The chemical control of breathing is, uh, for the most part, the brain automatically controls breathing normally if it's left alone. That's called the uh, like the the apneustic center, but the the brain stem itself is the main factor that controls it. It's pretty much decides on whether or not there's enough. Uh, it bases it on the level of CO2 or oxygen in the arterial blood is too high. Now, for people that don't have uh, respiratory issues like COPD, the brain senses if there's uh, how much, it goes by how much CO2 there is in the blood. Uh, it, for example, if you sit there and hold your breath for a while, you, you know, as long as you can, what your body's responding to is not the lack of oxygen, but the lack of CO2 that builds up, and then you're going to take a big gasp for it. Uh, when you run real fast, you build up the side effect of CO2 in your blood. Your body's going to breathe fast in order to breathe that off. So uh, CO2 is controlled by depth of resp uh, ventilations and the rate. Same way uh, if you have a patient that we're, your, and, and we're going to talk about things you might not have on a truck, like lab values and stuff like that. And it just goes into the big picture of, of putting it all together. So like back when I was on the helicopter, if I had a patient and I hooked them up on a vent and they were, had a high CO2, the way that you correct CO2 is uh, like in the body, breathe faster and harder. One thing I might do first, depending on how much pressure they had in them, is I might increase the respirations to try to blow it off. Uh, let's say I reach the respiratory, uh, their ventilation max as far as rate, then I could increase or decrease the volume that was going in. Uh, some patients that have uh, chronic respiratory diseases like a COPD, they actually run off what they call the hypoxic drive. Their CO2 is always high that that part just gave out. It don't even work no more. Then what they go by is how much oxygen's in their blood. If uh, they are low on oxygen, their body makes them breathe in order to get back up to that oxygen level. So, you know, there is a risk. They state that with uh, people that run off the hypoxic drive, if you give them enough oxygen or an overabundance of oxygen, their brain center is going to say, hey, uh, I got enough oxygen. I don't need to breathe anymore. So everybody just quit. You know, that is a chance that could happen. But usually it takes a long time. And uh, in all my years, I've never had anybody stop breathing because of I gave them too much oxygen. But if they did, you never, uh, a lack of oxygen will kill somebody. Their brain center, when they're diseased like that, just don't know enough anymore. It's not working right. So you got to work for it. So if they need oxygen, you give it to them. If they stop breathing, breathe for them. So that's just, remember, you never withhold oxygen for somebody that truly needs it. The uh, When you get, like if you get too much CO2, we're going to talk about acid-base balance later. And a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like that. But hey, it's something we got to get through. And it's really not that bad, really. Uh, but a decrease in pH, which means that the if you pH gets low, it means you're going to have more acid in your blood. Hydrogen ions are going to increase, and and CO2 is going to go up. Well, when your CO2 goes up and your pH goes down, that's a respiratory acidosis. It's control of a respiratory. Uh, and I'm going to teach you some terms that makes it a lot easier. I wish somebody showed me years ago. But when we get into acid-base balance, probably the next uh, class or two. But don't let uh, don't let it freak you. A lot of people think it's a nightmare, but I don't I don't really think it is at all. So, uh, but then if you got a, when the pH goes up, you got alkalosis. So if you got like an increase of pH in the blood, and you breathe real fast, you're giving off too much CO2. You got alkalosis. You've seen somebody that's hyperventilating. They say, oh, they're breathing off too much CO2. You got to have some to make it work right. But when they breathe off so much, they get alkalotic. And then they get in this vicious cycle that's hard for them to stop. They actually need to breathe in some carbon dioxide. And that's the old adage. I used to put people in a paper bag and things like that. So uh, a 
Well, here's that, what I was talking about. Just don't touch it real big, but just to kind of give you an idea of where you're at with it. Uh, <clears throat> acid is an increase of hydrogen ions. In other words, the pH goes low. The pH scale, you see down at the bottom, seven is neutral, 14 is base, zero is extremely acidotic. Now look at some of the material that are in between there of what we are. Now, uh, stomach acid, a one, man, that, that's, it's no wonder that people's esophagus and stuff like that gets eat away with it. It's even stronger than pickles. Uh, it, it's way down there. Whereas, uh, you know, something that is an extremely base or alkalotic is, is dangerous as well. You know, you got bleach way up there. You got ammonia, you know, bacon soda, the way it goes up. Uh, now, if you look down at the bottom, the more alkalotic bacteria can't handle a lot of acid. So the more base you get, the likelihood bacteria is going to go up and vice versa. On the, on the other side, fungi like it around uh, uh, coffee. Or, I'm sorry, I said it too early. Fungi I like it the more acidic it gets. Anybody ever it happens at work when everybody doesn't do their part? It's like you see a coffee pot that hadn't been changed in a few days, and you go in there and it's got like some kind of a fungi or mold in it because it's uh, got a little bit of acid in it, and fungi likes to grow in acid. Now, uh, take milk. See how fine the line it is around milk. Now, milk, if it starts to uh, get a little bit of age and goes up, and the bacteria starts growing in it, it starts stinking right. Now, the human body is actually a little bit on the base side. The, the normal range for the pH of a human body or human blood is 7.35 to 7.45. You remember that number from here forever. 7.35 to 7.45. Uh, the correct amount of CO2 someone's supposed to have in their blood is 3.5 to 4.5. So... It always wants a little bit of that uh, on the base side in there. So, uh, and pH from one number to the other is 10, it increases 10 times. So if you can look on there and see how much uh, like acid and things like that is in there, you know, you got hydrochloric acid and then you got stomach acid, you know, is one of the next things right next to it. And that's pretty, you know, it's pretty amazing your body can actually do that. And, uh, but, you know, people, they have ulcers and stuff like that where it breaks down and it leads through it. I, I watched an autopsy once for a man had uh, gastric ulcers so bad that he uh, never, he was a, he was a nightmare. He had like five pounds of, uh, no, five gallons of fluid on his abdomen when he got it off. He was so surrounded with fat. And when they, took his stomach out, it had a hole in it to where the ulcer had ate through and and contents, stomach contents had been leaking down into his abdomen for a few weeks now. So, I mean, that is, uh, that's pretty, pretty rough. Uh, buffer system is something that's constantly working in your body, whether it be the lungs or the kidneys, but it repeatedly has to neutralize the acids in the bases that keeps it in, uh, in check because it had we got a very fine line 7.35 to 7.45 is what normal homeostasis is and uh pretty much 6.9 to 8 is uh, 6 point less than 6.9 and over 8 is pretty much incompatible with life so and that's only what a little over seven one way like eight the other that is uh pretty much they're incompatible with life with that you got the respiratory component, which is the fastest way. You know, it eliminates excess acid quickly in the form of gas from the lungs by blowing it off. And the, the kidneys can uh, eliminate acid in the urine or uh, secrete sodium bicarb. And but that doesn't that can take hours to actually a few days even. So uh, and in severe cases of metabolic acidosis, they might have to give. Uh, sodium bicarb and things like that. So I know we don't get real deep into the uh, ventilation or the the labs in this part, but a few things I can tell you later that will actually show, uh, kind of give you an idea of how to, uh, just what 
it'll ha help you know what for if you ever look at lab sheets and stuff like that on transfers and stuff. So uh, we talk about ion shifts. It's simply what, how makes a solution more acidic. When you see uh, the uh, hydrogen ions, if they need to increase or not to make a solution more basic, sim simply means to reduce it. Uh, that's why if they have, if the other ones won't decrease, sometimes they'll give IV sodium bicarb. When uh, you probably seen in cardiac arrest before that if uh, you get somewhere and a patient has been down for a long time, uh, one of the things we want to give right behind epinephrine is sodium bicarb because you know they haven't been breathing. That carbon dioxide is built up. It's it's caused their pH to shift low to to be more acidic. So a lot of time we'll give that sodium bicarb right off the bat to uh, try to help us correct that. If sodium bicarb is given within enough time, a lot of times I've seen rhythms start generating after that because you've helped them reach the um, homeostasis as far as the pH scale goes. So. Uh, Some of the, the, the circulating buffer component, it's simply found uh, in the ICF and the ECF, like we talked about earlier, intracellular and extracellular. Carbonic acid is a weak acid that can uh, form, and it will actually create the bicarbonate in the blood if it's needed to. And that usually comes from like the duodenum, some of the, the gastric system that, that dumps it in there. Uh, but the fastest way is the renal component, and the slowest way is the kidney component is where that it It'll with hold them, it'll try to pee it out real quick. It'll try to pee it out real quick, but it doesn't happen that way. Think of somebody that's in DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. What do they do? They urinate a lot. They uh, Their body's trying to, to, to get rid of all of those acids and stuff that's in there, but it takes for days for it to happen. The uh, nervous system part that controls this, the medulla oblongata is the part of the brain responsible for the ventilation cycle. When you have brain damage or head injury, or intracranial pressure that presses down on those brain stems where the medulla is at, that's when you're going to have interruptions in the ventilation cycle. For instance, uh, we'll talk about later on as far as like Shane Stokes type respirations or Biot type respirations, where somebody with a head injury, they're going to breathe real fast, and sometimes real irregular, sometimes seesaw type motions up, you know, real fast, and then come right back down because the medulla is trying to, to regulate that uh, and it can't get. Uh, it can't get sequenced out when you've got all of that uh, pressure on it. The uh, lung volumes, remember tidal volume. That's simply the amount of air that's moved into or out of the lungs during a single breath. It uh, That's pretty much what is measurable. The inspiratory reserve volume is the deepest breath you can take after normal breath. In other words, you can force some more air in. So uh, as far as tidal volume, pretty much all you're going to have to move in and out roughly for an adult is uh, about 1,500. Uh, I'm sorry, about 500. So if you look at that down at the bottom there where it says tidal volume, well, that's how much air moves in and out. Well, you have a dead space. You have a dead space that uh, where there's no air exchange taking place in the trachea, in the bronchi. So and that's about 120 uh, cc's of air. So if you stop and think about it, it, it might take about 750 cc's of air to in order to uh, actually perform a gas exchange down to the alveoli. And a typical AMBU bag or a BVM for an adult is around uh 1500 so you know you don't want to squeeze all the way you blow too much air in and it stays in then you're going to have a problem with blood return and all that so just a uh, a quick squeeze on the bag you know uh fingers and hands not the big two thing new hand thing like people do but you only want to give enough to make the chest move and about half of what the bvm is that's about how much you want to do in that now what about uh a kid. There's a formula we'll talk about later how you can figure that out. But usually, if you got a correct size BVM for the child, 
there again, probably about half of it is all you need because uh, it's already structured to, to give that lower amount, but usually about half of it is about all you need for that part. Uh, remember, the depth of the breath that you give is critical. You don't want to give too much. It's better to give two subpar breaths than one that's over too much because you can you can hurt someone, especially uh, a, a younger a younger person. Now the uh, under talk about the the dead space and minute volume. The amount of air that someone moves in in a minute is simply uh, tidal volume times the ventilatory rate. That's how much they have. Now, there's a way, if you were going to do artificial ventilation for a long period of time, there's a way that you can, uh, a formula, you could figure it up on how much this person needs. But given this uh, point of it is it's how much, the minute volume is how much air they move in a minute. It's simply respiratory volume times how many breaths per minute they give. Uh, the characteristics of normal breathing, when you take vital signs, you're going to be looking for normal rate and depth, regular rhythm, good audible breath sounds on both sides. You want to look at chest rising and falling, movement of the abdomen. Now, when I give a report, when I look at somebody, I do an assessment. Uh, you know, first, I look at their breath. You don't want to tell them, hey, I'm taking your respirations because they're going to control it. But normal rate and rhythm, hey, they're breathing about, you know, they're breathing normal times a minute. They're not struggling. They're breathing regular. They're not having long period of gaps. Uh, take a listen to their chest. Do I hear anything wrong with it? If I hear something, uh, that's what we're going to come back to. And regular uh, rise and fall. When you document, hey, this patient had a normal rate and rhythm, symmetrical uh, breast uh, rise and fall of the chest, and uh, they uh, did not have any access movement of the, of the abdomen or accessory muscles. The, uh, I'll tell you what, that's where we're going to stop tonight, getting into the circulatory system, because it is a long night with that. So uh, we're going to stop here on, uh, I think it's number 77. And I'm going to give you the pin for tonight is... one one six. Eight two nine, one one six eight two nine is your pin. Okay, and uh, when we start back uh, Monday, we'll pick up right here and go on because these are too long. Uh, you know, too long chapters, but it's very important as you can see. And as we go on a little bit further, it gets a little bit more interesting. We're getting away from the cellular, the chemical stuff, which is very, you know, I got. I'll be honest with you, it's very. Uh, it can get deep and it can get boring. It's got something you got to say around think about and study yourself. Anyway, I'm going to say good night for tonight. Uh, if anybody have any comments, questions, or concerns, I'll see if anybody's mic pops green. But uh, otherwise, we'll be back here Monday night at about 6 o'clock. Anybody... Uh, anybody has any issues, like I said, you can... Uh, Send us a uh, get a hold of Rob Roy as far as the uh, mechanical or electrical stuff, and otherwise uh, I'll have uh, some information for you Monday that might make us this some of this stuff a little bit easier for you. Try to get you some handouts and stuff showed to you and emailed to you because I got all of his email and stuff. All right, I'm going to say good night, y'all. And uh, if anybody needs anything, please uh, save the questions for me and stuff and. Uh, We'll see you next. We'll see you in a few days.